Tonight, airstrikes near Baghdad, tech disappointments from top companies, and frightening news on inflation, all conspire to send stocks plunging. This is Moneyline. Reporting tonight from Los Angeles, Willow Bay. And from New York, Stuart Varney. Welcome to Moneyline. I'm Willow Bay in Los Angeles. Good evening, Willow. Good evening, everyone. I'm Stuart Varney in New York. Word of the airstrikes today hit Wall Street when the mood of the markets was already very fragile. Investors went into the session digesting some troubling reports from three crucial companies. Dell, Hewlett Packard and Nortel. Compounding the anxiety, reports on the economy, sparking fears that we're facing the punishing combination of slow growth and, literally, soaring inflation. The Nasdaq bore the brunt of the damage, ending down 127 points, 5% at 24.25. The Dow fell 91, it closed just under 10,800. The four blue-chip tech stocks accounted for about half of today's loss. The S&P 500, it tumbled 25 points, ending at 13.01. Investors were clearly on edge as they confronted developments from thousands of miles away. Greg Clarkin tracks the news and the market reaction as today's events unfolded. 7 a.m. Investors are already rattled, digesting layoffs and weak profits at Nortel and Dell. And bad news from drug giant Shearing Plow. The FDA said some of its plants were substandard. The stock is down $9 on that news and pre-open trading at $39 a share. 8.30 a.m., the next shocker. News that wholesale prices posted a startling jump last month. Paper, cars, and cigarette prices all skyrocketed. The news sounds inflation alarms in the bond market a minute later. Treasury's giving up all of their gains on this really much bigger than expected PPI number. 9.30 a.m., the markets stagger at the open. The Dow immediately begins to sink. The Nasdaq falls more than 100 points in the first minutes of trading. 10 a.m., another sell signal for investors. A report on consumer sentiment. It checks the mood of consumers, and it finds they were in a lousy mood in the first half of the month. Investors are thoroughly confused. I think the best thing that one could do to give uh, investors advice is to sit on their hands here and wait for things to work themselves out. 1.09 p.m., CNN confirms that the U.S. and Britain launched airstrikes against Iraq. The Dow weakens down 169 points in the hour after the news. The Nasdaq falls as much as 155 points, or 6 percent. 2.45 p.m., the Pentagon holds a briefing to explain the military action. The military operation was conducted. Back on Wall Street, investors start to nibble at some beaten down stocks. We actually got a uh, news about the bombing in Iraq that's relatively uh, muted due to the fact that it's the Friday before a long weekend. I think it's really falling on deaf ears. 4 p.m., the closing bell. The Dow closes well off its lows, but not the Nasdaq. It finishes off more than 5%. Greg Clark in CNN Financial News, New York. The big problem for the markets? Yes, those tech stocks. Steve Young takes a closer look. Tech investors could run, but they couldn't escape the jaws of the end of the week tech wreck. On Nortel's warning, telecom equipment companies were tortured. Due to Dell's disappointing earnings, computer companies were creamed. And chip stocks were swamped by the ripple as companies that make machines to produce chips got squashed. Tech stocks caught in the carnage included Nortel, Corning, Hewlett Packard, and Compaq, along with Novellus, Vitesse, Xilinx, EMC, and Cabletron. Analysts and investors feel like they're driving in the dark. In most cases, companies are giving only a single quarter of limited guidance. The vogue word is visibility. So just lack of uh, visibility and a continued inventory correction, which should last at least through the March quarter. I think it's a testament to the fact that visibility is very low. And what investors are hearing from tech heavyweights like Nortel, Dell, and HP isn't very reassuring. Longer than expected delays in spending. Demand in our sector has clearly declined. Visibility remains extremely limited. There's that visibility word again. One analyst says telecom had a two-year party and it's going to take a while to get things fixed. We do think there are some fundamental structural problems regardless what uh, the companies are talking. This is not related to Fed or, re or recession. It's structural issues. Structural issues like size. One analyst notes when tech companies generate $30 billion in sales like Lucent, Motorola, Dell, and Intel, it becomes hard to keep up the momentum. The largest revenue companies may struggle the next few years. The good news is you should be looking for the next generation leaders who could very well succeed over the next three to five years. 
Problem is, with that limited guidance from up and coming as well as established companies, picking the next generation of leaders can be very tricky. Willow? Yeah, Thanks, Steve Young reporting. Taking a look, other stocks moving today, sharing Plow Plunge 7, that is more than 15%. The drug maker warned that an FDA investigation of its plants will force profits to fall short of forecasts. Yahoo lost more than three after its director of Asian operations resigned. The news followed yesterday's surprise resignation of Yahoo's Europe chief. Nextel posted a narrower than expected loss, but the wireless carrier warned of significantly greater expenses in the first half of the year, sending its shares down more than four dollars. Covad Communications didn't even trade today. The high-speed internet access provider delayed reporting financial results and said accounting revisions will hurt its already ailing bottom line. Covad has lost 95 percent of its value in the past year. As we've said, the markets today were hit with a triple whammy, trouble abroad, tech letdowns, and an all-out inflation scare. Producer prices rocketed in January, and that wasn't even the worst of it. Lisa Leiter reports. Wholesale prices surged last month at their fastest pace in more than a decade. Dumbfounding economists worried more about recession than inflation. The producer price index jumped 1.1 percent in January, fueled by spiking energy prices. Even the core rate, which excludes food and energy, rose more than expected. That's because rising oil and gas prices are pushing up costs for other items, while at the same time cutting into consumer spending. Going forward, we're going to see relatively less in the way of real economic growth and relatively more in the way of inflation. And that's the definition of stagflation. But other economists shrugged off the report, saying sharp jumps in tobacco and auto prices may be a one-month fluke. We're looking at uh, substantial easing of price pressures of industrial materials, industrial commodities, and with the slowdown in the economy, I think the news uh, at the end of the day is, is going to be a story about disinflation. Also baffling economists, a new report showing new home construction in January jumped to the highest level in nine months. Cheaper mortgages seem to be encouraging home builders and home buyers. When the Fed started dropping rates, I think it just kind of eased everything. We were calling every day, checking interest rates to lock in um, as late as we could because we knew the Fed was going to keep lowering rates, so we were really excited about that. What consumers are doing is different than what they're saying. A key gauge of consumer confidence plunged for the third straight month to its lowest level since 1996. Consumers are seeing the layoffs. They're concerned about that. Their spending is going to be cautious. We're seeing the impact of that in the industrial sector already. Another new report shows industrial output dropped again in January as factories operated at their lowest level since 1992. Four economic reports with four very different messages, making it more challenging for futures traders here at the Chicago Board of Trade to predict the size of the Fed's next rate cut. And today's action was a case in point. This morning, after that very strong inflation and housing news, traders were betting there was just a one in three chance that the Fed would cut by another half a point at its meeting next month. But then, once they got that big drop in consumer confidence and industrial production, they changed their bet very quickly, and it now stands at a 60% chance that the Fed will cut rates by a half a point next month. And Willow, that's likely to change again before March 20th. <laughs> As you say, Lisa, some complicated messages. Thanks, Lisa. In the bond market today, bonds got hit early on by that strong inflation news, but the weak reading on consumer sentiment key to the Fed sparked a turnaround, as did the Baghdad bombing. The 10-year note gained more than half a point. The 30-year was up nearly three-quarters of a point. The yield at 5.45 percent. On the eve of his first G7 meeting, Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill today threw the currency markets into an uproar. He appeared to question a long-time mainstay of U.S. policy, the strong dollar. Since O'Neill was the longtime chief at Alcoa, some currency traders fear he might go weak on the dollar, which might help jumpstart exports. And the comments picked up today by a German newspaper merely intensified those fears. Here's what the paper had, to say, had him saying, quote, We are not pursuing, as it is often said, a policy of a strong dollar. In my opinion, a strong dollar is the result of a strong economy, end quote. The Treasury Department later denied any change in policy, and that helped stabilize the dollar. But the U.S. currency still lost ground, despite some late safe haven buying on news of the Iraqi airstrikes. Willow. Coming up, the military's first action under the new commander-in-chief. What shape are the armed services in? We'll take a look. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Congratulations. Your new website is averaging 476,000 hits a day, generating more than a million new bits of information about your customers every week. That sound you hear isn't your technology at work. It's all that information crying out to be understood. Welcome to America Online, new version 6.0. The easiest just got even easier. You just plug it in and you go. With 6.0, all the best features are even better. You've got mail. Customer service is always there to help. Parental controls help safeguard our kids. You can log on from anywhere. And now you can even hear your AOL email and get your favorite features on any phone just by dialing a toll-free number. 6.0 is the best AOL ever. America Online, new version 6.0. So easy to use, no wonder it's number one. Call 1-800-4-ONLINE now. All right, boys, last card. I'm going to raise your dollar. You must have something, boys. It's just a buck. Hey, don't you know about 10-10-220? What? Yeah, oh, man, 10-10-220. All calls up to 20 minutes. 99 cents. I'm just 7 cents a minute after that. All calls up to 20 minutes for only 99 cents? See, a buck is worth a lot. I'm out. Me too. Man. I call you. Do you have any fives? Go fish. <laughs> Dial 10-10-220. These are moments frozen in time, moments that shocked the nation. This is the story of how these moments forced a father and a son apart and changed the world forever. You think you admitted anger? There's nothing you feeling I ain't felt times ten. Danny Glover leads a powerful cast in Freedom Song, Sunday night at 8 on TNT. In tonight's Moneyline Focus, military readiness. Today's airstrikes against Iraqi targets marked President Bush's first major military action. While Mr. Bush was said to be satisfied with the outcome, our next guest says the new commander-in-chief has inherited an armed force with less firepower than it had just 10 years ago. Joining me now, Gideon Rose from the Council on Foreign Relations. Gideon, welcome to the program. Thank you for being here. We hear today that standoff weaponry was used today. American planes did not want to cross the 33rd parallel. They stood beyond it and, and uh, an attack from a distance. Is that the kind of technology that America is in short supply of and will be buying more of later? In the sense that it's advanced technology weaponry that gives us the option to do things without being struck back at easily, yes, we'll be buying more of it. But I don't think there's any readiness crisis in that area at the moment. Is there a readiness crisis in any area of the military at the moment? Not immediately. Charitably, you could say that such concerns come from looking at worst-case scenarios that are very unlikely. Uncharitably, you can say it's trash-talking for other agendas. Uh, is there no equipment shortage at any part of the, of the military force? If this were to escalate into a serious war and there were other conflicts elsewhere, you might start to get both equipment crises uh, and problems with spare parts, transport, and so forth. But I think we're very unlikely to see that. Let's look at the balance of spending. As I understand it, over the past few decades, there has not been much of a change in how much is spent on the Navy and Marines, the Air Force, and the Army. Well, today's operation was an Air Force operation. Kosovo was essentially an Air Force operation. Is there going to be a shift in who gets what within the military? Well, that's a really big question. Uh, the Bush administration is reviewing that right now, and they have one of the nation's most respected thinkers on defense policy, Andrew Marshall of the Pentagon, yeah. conducting that review. But there'll be entrenched interests, both in Congress and the armed forces themselves, resisting any significant change because there's a lot of inertia behind the current system. Is there going to be any big increase in military spending overall until Mr. Marshall has finished his review? I don't see a significant dramatic increase. The best that can be hoped for is over time we'll rejigger the armed forces to better serve American needs down the road. The best thing about the new administration, in my view, is that these top national security officials not only know what they're doing, but they're willing and able to override parochial interests if they need to. Would you say that America in future will be buying far more technology than heavy metal? I think they will, and they certainly should be. Okay. Uh, Gideon Rose, Council on Foreign Relations, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. Okay. Still to come on Moneyline, California's governor and his new plan to rescue the state from the ongoing power crisis. We'll have an update from California.
Moneyline Focus is brought to you by Brobeck, Flager, and Harrison. Brobeck, the law firm, when your future is at stake. Log on to CNNFN.com slash Moneyline for more bios and background on industry moneymakers. Your future. Your future. Brobeck. Brobeck. Patent infringement. Intellectual property. Intellectual property. Reverse engineering. Reverse engineering. Reverse engineering. Copyright protection. Copyright protection. Copyright protection. Copyright. Fighting for your intellectual property. Intellectual property. Probeck. Probeck. The law firm. When your future is at stake. Well, what are you I'm doing? Cleaning up in here. No, no. This, this is the backbone of our entire financial plan. Uh, uh, statement, statement. Oh, top 100 mutual fund. Statement. Tech. Still sizzling. Oh, is it? Uh, honey, this is from 1997. Oh. Want a little guidance? Mm -hmm. Introducing the personal financial consultant from Quicken Riley, a Fleet Boston financial company. The new AOL Time Warner, working to make your life more enjoyable. The world's best information and entertainment will be available to you wherever you are. And you'll stay in touch with your friends, family, and colleagues anytime, anywhere. The very best of AOL Time Warner on your television, telephone, portable devices, and the Internet. It's your choice. You're in control. AOL Time Warner, committed to making your life easier, better, and more enjoyable. In tonight's sector report, California's struggling utilities. This afternoon, Governor Gray Davis unveiled his plan to bail out the Golden State's utilities. Standing in his way, a hefty price tag and some tough Republican opposition. Casey Wyan has been following this story for us, and he joins us with the latest developments. Casey? Well, Governor Davis says his plan to rescue California's big investor-owned utilities involves shared pain by all concerned. Southern California Edison and Pacific Gas and Electric have been pushed to the brink of bankruptcy, largely because they've had to pay $12 billion more for power over the past year than they've been able to collect from customers. Davis's plan calls for the state to buy the utilities 32,000 miles of power lines. The price is still being negotiated. Davis would only say it will be some multiple of their book value, about $3 billion. The utilities would use that money and money from revenue bonds to pay down debt. They'd also be required to sell power from their own plants at cost for 10 years. While Davis continues to say he doesn't foresee rate hikes, they are possible, some say likely. It's my hope that utilities will realize that this is fair to both sides. They understand I made a promise to the people of the state that we're not bailing out a virtually insolvent institution. We are providing value to them and equivalent value to the ratepayers. Republicans and consumer advocates have expressed opposition to key elements of the plan, especially those that could lead to rate hikes. And we're still waiting for official reaction from the state's two investor-owned utilities. Southern California Edison says it's studying the plan, and Pacific Gas and Electric has not returned phone calls. Davis says negotiations continue with both companies, and he expects legislation to pass in about two weeks, Willow. Casey, what does this mean? Does it remove the threat of bankruptcy from the utilities? It does not. If the utilities creditors don't think the negotiations are going quickly enough, they could force them into bankruptcy at any time. All right, Casey, thanks. Let's take a look at investor reaction. Both utility stocks gained ahead of the new power plan. Edison International added 69 cents and PG&E up 16 cents. Stuart? Well, a real drama today. Military action in the oil patch and a huge jump in inflation. How does that play out financially? We'll be joined next by John Lipsky. He's the chief economist. Mr. J.P. Morgan. We'll be back. Monday on Moneyline, a special edition. Trailblazers, some famous, some not. Part of an emerging trend. Senior citizens committed to the 9 to 5. Profiles of workers who insist that retirement can wait. Real drama for people in the financial business today. Number one, a huge jump in inflation. Number two, military action in the heart of oil country. Let's tie all this together with the help of John Lipsky, chief economist at J.P. Morgan. John? Thanks, Stuart. Glad to be here. A surge in producer prices. Military action right in the heart of oil country. Is this a double negative for America's economy? Well, it's not good news. Now, the, the rise in inflation was mainly due to higher energy prices, and this week uh, Chairman Greenspan told us that higher energy prices were much more a threat 
to growth than they were to inflation. The military action uh, should not be a, a big effect on, on uh, energy prices, which had been coming down in the past few weeks as growth is slowing. So let's hope it's only a, a single whammy. Is there a chance that we've got a mild case of stagflation here? After all, the economy is slowing, and here you have the producer price index going up more than 1%. Well, yes, but I don't think that stagflation is a real risk here whatsoever, and I don't think uh, investors are really worried about that, and they're right about it. Uh, energy prices went up, but as I said, more recently they've been coming down in the last few weeks, including natural gas prices. Uh, food prices went up, but that's not going to stay. Auto prices went up, but that's not going to stay either. Demand is slowing. There aren't going to be price pressures. Not so bad as it looks then, huh? I think that's right. Fed Chairman Greenspan, what's his response going to be to all of this? Well, if the data play out as we think, on March 20th, we'll see a 50 basis point cut in Fed funds rate. Nothing before then? Not unless there's some provocation. Let me ask you a political question, if I may. I know you're an economist, <laughs> but let, let's talk politics for a second. America rallies around its commander-in-chief when American troops go to fight. That happens. Yes. Is that a political plus for the Republicans in their battle against the Democrats to get tax cuts through Congress? Oh, goodness, that's a tough one. Well, what I'm really asking is, do, does this kind of event today make it a little easier for the president to push his policies in Congress? I suspect that the, with slowing growth on the, on the horizon, that there seems to be in Washington a willingness to go back to old Keynesian logic and say, let's use tax cuts as a stimulus. That's not so good. The issue should be much more structural in the terms that, for example, Chairman Greenspan spoke a few weeks ago. Uh, but it seems right now that the picture in Congress is rather confused. Uh, it seems to me more likely that it's going to take a bit of time to sort out a tax cut, but certainly one is coming. If there was a tax cut along the lines that Mr. Bush proposes, what would be the economic impact, good or bad? Oh, I think they, they will be good. They will not come quickly, however. Uh, the tax cuts we're talking about, they're being proposed, are not, not terribly large, and they're really not designed to give the economy a quick boost. I uh, think, once again, here we are talking about Mr. Greenspan again, but he's, he said earlier this week that the tax cuts would serve more as an insurance for the economy if it turned out to be weaker than expected. But they're not of a magnitude or a type that are going to make a difference. And I don't think tax cuts, I think most economists think tax cuts are not a good vehicle to try to stimulate the economy. You don't think that if we had a bigger tax cut than Mr. Bush proposes, and you really front-end load it with huge cuts right now, that wouldn't get this economy moving? Well, <laughs> I think folks would worry about when the bill was coming. The alternative is let's have Mr. Greenspan cut rates faster than the markets currently expect. That one for sure would help things get going. Last question. Do you think this economy will start rolling by the second half of this year? Yes, later in the second half of this year. Those folks who were talking about a quick V slowdown and quick V speed up, I think are going to be quite wrong. Right now it looks like the first quarter is going to, growth is going to be somewhere between zero and one percent. The risks now is that the second quarter will be slower than the first quarter. I don't think you could be thinking about a really quick turnaround. Fair enough. John Lipsky, Chief Economist at J.P. Morgan, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Stuart. Okay. Up next, ahead of the curve, some of what you need to know tonight ahead of next week's trading. Stay with us, please. The Internet helps you reach millions of customers around the globe. Who's keeping you in touch with the Internet? Fujitsu. The possibilities are infinite. Taking a look ahead at what to keep an eye on next week, enjoy the long weekend. The markets will be closed on Monday for the President's Day holiday. Then watch for earnings on Tuesday from retailing bellwethers, Walmart and Home Depot. Keep an eye on the economic numbers, the consumer price index and leading indicators for January and December's international trade balance. Of course, please join us for full market coverage on Ahead of the Curve. That's every weekday morning at 5 a.m. Eastern, right here on CNN. That is Moneyline for this Friday. I'm Willow Bay in Los Angeles. And I'm Stuart Barney in New York. Good night from New York and enjoy that weekend. For all
your financial news all the time. CNNFN.com. On the web, 24 hours a day.